how are you? I'm fine, you all right? Yes, I'm good. So we've got a few people watching. Um, and you're live from pool. I'm live from pool. Who knew? Just like proper I television. <laughs> how exciting. <laughs> So, it's been so weird because all afternoon I'm like, what should I be doing? I should be doing something rather than just being in my flat, resting my phone on a banana. You're not on a banana anymore. Now you're on a candle. Well, that's okay. I, I've, I've actually put a bra and a top on today. So I think, <laughs> I think we're really rocking this webinar. We're rocking this. This yeah, is, this this is, is the way to go. This is definitely how the professionals do it. <laughs> so I'm just hoping my chair doesn't collapse or the... Or the candle doesn't fall over because then it's just going to be really embarrassing. But then we know what will happen, would have happened. So that's okay. So I was going to <laughs> ask you some questions, unsurprisingly. And I'm just going to try yeah. and turn the sound up so I can hear you a bit better. So um, I'm wondering, tell me how long have you been sober or alcohol free now? 16 months. And so I gave up on the 27th of November, 2016. And do you prefer sober or alcohol free? I don't mind really. Oh, that's Either. Oh, it's, it's I thought it's... you were going to say, "Do you mind sober or drinking?" And I was like, "Sober." <laughs> but no, I don't mind sober or alcohol free. Is fine. That's cool. So, um, tell me a bit about who who Dawn was as a drinker. Who were you? <laughs> oh, nutter. Um, yeah, I was a, a bit. I was a party animal, basically. Um, one drink, and that was it. The the night just went on all night. So. Um, yeah, getting used to the sober me that goes to bed at, like, I can barely stay awake beyond nine o'clock at the moment, um, is quite different to the person that I used to be. Um, I've always said I, d I don't consider myself to be an alcoholic. I wasn't physically dependent on alcohol, but um, I drank enough at the weekend to sink a small ship, so, and spent a lot of time, it was either drinking or being sick at the weekends, and so, obviously, for me, that became a big problem. And um, there's many small ships in pool, so you had um, <laughs> many years to deal with that. Um, yeah. Did, did you, because I'm always really interested in the fact that um, our drinking histories, our drinking lives, are, are not actually very linear. We, we go through different stages with drinking. So what is it that put, were you always that heavy a drinker or did it get pushed up by something in particular? Or, you know, what, what, what did, would you say was different by the time you came to the point where you were going to give up drinking or thought was thinking about it? Um, the re the, one of the reasons why I decided to stop was because I was at weekends drinking on Friday and then not making plans for the rest of the weekend. So people would ask me to do things on Saturday or Sunday and I'd be like, I'd be saying that I was doing something else because I knew the hangover would be so bad that I wouldn't be able to function. So that was a big sign. I, I, I mean, whether I was always a massive drink, I mean, I think when you're young, you kind of launch into it. I mean, I drank like the Blue Wickets and the Cider. And, oh, gosh, just even thinking about it. Um, and then got onto the wine. And then I think it was kind of acceptable to drink a bottle of wine. And then, and then you'd buy two. Because yeah. if you drank the bottle and then there was none left, then you'd want a bit more. So then I'd have two in the house. And then when you'd finish the two bottles and you were like rocking around, you know, I used to rock around this place on two bottles of wine um, and just feel awful the next day, something had to change. But it was kind of like once I'd like opened a bottle of wine, I mean, like when people say I've opened a bottle of wine and I've left half of it, I don't think that ever happened unless I was too drunk to remember that I'd got it. Um, you know, I, there was never any empty wine, um, leftover wine in my fridge. It was always empty bottles. Um, and, you know, I would go, I could go for like a week without drinking anything. So I would go Monday, right, I'm not going to drink anything. But then by Thursday, you're like, oh, I've done really well. So, yeah. I need to reward myself. <laughs> yeah, I'll reward myself. I'm being so good. And then Thursday night became my Friday because I don't know why, but I was like, oh, yeah, you know, party time. And then, um, and then it just carried on from there. And, it, yeah, it just became an issue for me I mean I think that's the thing I don't really agree with labeling who you are or what you are with regards to alcohol if you've got a problem if you think you've got a problem that's that's between you and yourself and I I had a problem with alcohol and I didn't like the way that it was making me feel anymore so when 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 and how did you decide that you wanted to change so I 
I, I'd, I'd started to have enough of it because I was being sick every weekend. Um, so, so basically, I'd drink Friday, stay up really late, and then spend all day in bed. So it was becoming a problem because I just was sick of being sick. Um, and then I saw, I don't know why it happened. I was thinking about this because in the, I wrote a chapter in the book, which was about how I saw these articles that started coming up on my Facebook and I hadn't been Googling sober or alcohol free or anything, but it was quite weird that these things had started appearing. Maybe someone was watching me and I saw this article, it was on Bored Panda, which was a comparison of people, um, when they'd given up drinking and they just looked amazing, their skin and their eyes and they'd obviously lost weight. They just looked amazing. And that's where the idea came from because I thought, oh, I can do this. So I started saying to my friends, oh, I'm going to give up for a year. And then one, I'm, I'm, what I've realized from doing that and from the blog is that once I open my mouth and say that I'm going to do something, if I'm kept accountable by doing that, then I have to do it. So I was kind of like, right, I'm going to give up drinking for a year probably said when I was pissed and um and then I started thinking oh god I've actually said I'm doing it for a year a year is a really long time um but because I'd started to tell so many people I kind of got a bit stuck into it and then once I started thinking about it, I was like oh a year's not that long you know it'll be fine but um once I'd started a year like the first month dry January you've got a lot of people on your side so you're quite all right you know your whole gang's not drinking it's fine by the time you get to February, you're kind of thinking, hmm, this is going to be a really long year. And that's why I decided to write about it as well, because I thought it was going to be a real down. <laughs> I, I just thought I was going to be like, oh, my God, it's, you know, life is awful. And actually, it just went completely the other way. I like it because you, you did two. Um, mostly we 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 um, there are behavior change techniques we all use and we do it by accident. And so by yeah. accident, you did two things that were really important. One is you told other people, made yourself accountable. And the second... With my big mouth. Yeah, well, <laughs> I'm the same. I'm be the same. The first thing I did was I booked, I booked a day course and then I went and told three close friends. And actually the look of relief on their face told me so much. The rest of that evening is probably slightly too embarrassing and is probably in the pages of Diva right now. But anyway... <laughs> but um, but you you it's, it's a key behaviour change technique. Whether you join club soda, whether you tell your friends, you you become accountable. And then you decided to write. And writing is not for everybody, as you can tell. It's not something that I I I do a lot of in particular. But you you definitely decided that that was part of of the process, and it was something that you could do to begin to fill your time. What else yeah. did you change? Did you change anything immediately or did dry January cover you for a while? And what other sort of small, they don't have to be big, but small changes did you make that, that, that were part of that process at the beginning? What, yeah, well, I think you said it, it's filling time. I mean, God, days just go on forever, don't they? They're just <laughs> ridiculous. I was like awake at five, like, well, what do I do now? And without a hangover, you, you know, I'm still the same now. I can't get back to sleep. So you were like, right, get up. I think everybody does the cleaning thing, decluttering. You know, you're just like, and then you're like, oh my God, it's nine o'clock on a Saturday morning and I've still got a whole day. What am I going to do with all this time? So I had to, I had to start filling it. I, I listened to podcasts was my main thing and started walking. Um, I, podcasts did save me because when you're listening to other people's stories, I think it, it, you kind of listen and you go, well, I wasn't that bad, so it's okay. Or you listen and you go, oh, we're the same. Or you're kind of like, oh, they haven't really got, you know, a bottle of wine a week, that's not really a problem. But like I say, if you think you've got a problem, then you've got a problem. It doesn't matter what everybody else is doing. We, we, love, so, to, we love to compare with other people to try and justify the decisions that we make about yeah. our drinking. Like, yeah. oh, it's okay. The French don't drink as much as us. They get it. They, they've got it all sorted. Not true at all. <laughs> High levels of liver cirrhosis. So, you know, um, yeah. we, we, we like to, to do those comparisons to justify decisions we make to ourselves. So either we go, yeah, they've got loads of liver cirrhosis in France, so I'm giving up drinking too. <laughs> or we go, they know how to drink properly. There must be a normal way to drink. And that isn't yeah. true either. So. Well, if you drink with food, it's perfectly okay, yeah. apparently. <laughs> yeah, perfectly all right. So, um, yeah, I'm... I mean, what I, the, I was supposed to get sober on the on the New Year's Eve of the six, uh, 2016, 17. That was the plan. But then I ended up really ill with flu. So a lot of people asked me about my day one, 
my day one was never supposed to be day one. Day, day one was just another day after a really heavy drinking weekend. Um, and, you know, I'd set it all up. It was all, I, I was going to take photos on New Year's Eve, you know, of how fat I was and how awful I looked, blah, blah, blah. But actually, by New Year's Eve, I'd been sober for 35 days. So it, nothing went to plan. And I kind of feel that the flu was a really good thing because I smoked quite heavily as well when I was drinking. And, um, and by getting that flu, I, I had no interest in alcohol and I had no interest in cigarettes. So for two weeks, I was completely flat out. So I kind of feel that I was really lucky to get that because it gave me a really good head start because I had no interest in, in going out. But it hit at Christmas, which is a really hard time to give up because then you're like, oh, shall I just do Christmas? And then I'll, you know, stick to my original plan. Um, and Christmas is, you know, it is a nightmare. I mean, it's getting easier, but it, it, it is just so full of alcohol. Were you, so were you sober over there Christmas? Yeah. So you did two weeks, um, you, you basically gave up two weeks before Christmas. That's phenomenal. I gave up, well, I gave up on the 27th of November. I was basically in bed for a couple of weeks ill. Um, and then by the time I started coming out, the Christmas party started. I think around the 8th of December, I couldn't go to a party because I was, I was still so ill. I was deaf, I couldn't hear properly. Um, I, I was just in a terrible state. And I kind of look back at that and wonder if that was another sign. You know, now is the time. You've done yourself Cause, in. Because there never enough. is a good time. There never is. I no. gave up two uh, weeks before my birthday, and that's still the best one of the best things I ever did because I... I hit a big first really early and realised that the sky doesn't fall in. So how did you feel coming out of that Christmas having not drunk? Because you must have begun to feel your flu must have been going near the end of that Christmas. How did you feel having not drunk over Christmas? Well, I felt quite smug, really, because I was 35 days ahead of where I was supposed to be. So I kind of felt that like I started dry January with, with a month in the bag. And bearing in mind at this point, I was still going to get hammered on the New Year's Eve that was coming in 1718 so i was like actually i mean one of my friends did say to me actually because you started so early you can actually drink next christmas i was like oh my god that's brilliant yeah didn't think about that so that was also quite weird how my mindset changed because at the beginning i had every intention of getting absolutely annihilated the following christmas um and then obviously i didn't and and everything changed um so yeah, it was it was it was good going into January being sober, but um, yeah, Christmas was difficult. I just remember kind of thinking, you know, because we used to have Bucks Fizz at seven o'clock in the morning on on yeah. Christmas Day. And it was something like it's a, it's like another day though, isn't it? That goes on forever. I just can't believe these days. Like weddings just last like five weeks when you're at one. Christmas Day lasts forever. You're just like, oh my God, is it still only 12 o'clock? Yeah, and everybody it? else is hammered. And you're kind of like so in the moment. It's, it's, so, it's hard at the beginning. So let me ask you some other questions. I'm really, I've been really struck by some posts today. And then somebody else just asked a question. Because some people have, um, have said that they've been having headaches. So they've started drinking again because they think that's why they're having headaches. I'm saying, yeah, that's probably because you're having some mild um, sense of, uh, of withdrawal. And I was really tired for three months after giving up drinking. Mm. And somebody else has just mentioned that in the questions below. Um, and I didn't attribute that to actually withdrawal symptoms, but now I look back and now I know more, I realize that basically that's my body repairing itself. What, yeah. what happened to you in those months after you got over your cold, you did your Christmas, then, then what did you begin to notice early on? Was it all jumping up and down like a fairy going, oh my God, no. I'm brilliant. Or were there some shit bits, basically? I, I always say to people that the people that are in the first three months kind of expect miracles. And the thing is, you've been drinking for so many years. Like, I think my drinking career was like 25 years or something like that, 20, 28 years. It was, a, it, you know, most of my life. So if you stop drinking, you're not just going to suddenly, you're not going to lose three stone. You're not going to wake up at five o'clock in the morning feeling amazing. I kind of did and then I didn't. And then I, you're just all over the place because you're stopping taking a drug. And I, I put a post on um, last week about, you know, I, 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 when you withdraw from a, a hard drug like heroin, for example, you go through a, a, a time that, you're in a terrible state. And that's no different when you're drinking. And I think we all kind of think, you know, we do in dry January, don't we? 30 days off, we're going to feel amazing and then expect miracles to happen. Yeah. It's, it doesn't happen like that. Um, 
at 90 days, whilst I was ecstatic about what I'd achieved, I was the worst I was. My eczema was so out of control. It was just ridiculous. Um, and now I look back at it. One of my friends said to me, it's just the badness coming out. And you're kind of like, at the time, because it's so bad, you're like, it, it, no, but I've done three months. I've been sober for three months. Why is my skin so bad? But I do now look back. I mean, it's been brilliant ever since. So I think your body kind of goes through this, um, you know, it, it is a healing process. And you just have to be a bit patient. There isn't a bit I, of your body that... I think there isn't a bit of your body that alcohol doesn't impact and how quickly no. bits of your body recover very differently. It can take your metabolism a year to recover after giving up drinking. And and I want to be clear here that nearly... um, When people sign up to Club Soda, we often ask them to do a test on where their drinking is. And, and most people in Club Soda are drinking in the upper quartile. We're not dependent drinkers, but we're drinking... We're drinking not far below that. We're, we're some of the biggest drinkers. And there's a real big difference between how somebody who might just drink on a Friday night might feel after giving up drinking yeah. and how we might feel. And there's definitely some withdrawal symptoms. I was thirsty beyond belief. And I hadn't drunk water for years because why drink, drink water when there was wine? <laughs> why drink water when there was cider? You know, I, I hydrated through alcohol and I was just lucky that I drank enough alcohol that there was some hydration in it as well, I guess. But who knows? <laughs> I remember once going with um, a bladder infection and, and um, apologising to the doctor because I knew I hadn't drunk enough fluids and I was embarrassed about my drinking. But my enough of the right fluids. Huh? Enough of the right, right fluids. fluids. Yeah, so, and so um, I was desperately thirsty and drank tonnes of water and I, I, I was very tired. But once that lifted, it was bloody amazing. Yeah. I mean, I've always drunk a lot of water as well. Well, mainly because I'm always dehydrated or was dehydrated. Yeah. But my skin, so I've had eczema since I was about five, um, and that's always been attributed to stress. Um, and But I, one of the things that really irritates me is I, I kept going to the doctors, you get the cream, you put the cream on. It's just a cycle of put the cream on, it goes away for a bit, and then it comes back. And that never, no one has ever asked me in the whole of my life, 43 years, what do you put in? What What is it that you're putting in that's coming out you know yeah. it's just a, a, now I'm just like oh my god if they'd asked me what I was eating I was eating crap I was eating takeaways I never had any food in my fridge I only had wine um and maybe some water I never had any food because I was always just eating crap out of the freezer or and you know put on loads of weight from doing that as well and um now I look I mean my skin is like different I was, I was speaking to my parents about it at lunchtime it's like different skin because it's hydrated it's not covered in eczema i'm not itching all the time i'm not and because you know that stresses you out as well and that is purely bit down to being yeah. high, you know suitably hydrated and i gave up smoking as well i mean you know i kind of forget about the smoking thing but they went hand in hand for me you know just smoking drinking smoking drinking and that's crap for your skin as well so you know getting rid of all of those toxins i am now a temple yeah I thought you were a pleasure beach, but, you know, but that's okay. <laughs> I have a peer. <laughs> um, I'm not a sunken ship. Um, somebody's asking about vitamins, and actually, I mean, interestingly for me, because um, you talk about um, the fact that you immersed yourself in, in blogs and um, podcasts and stuff, and again, as behaviour change techniques go, being on Club Soda, listening to other people's stories is really, really um, important. We, we learn vicariously, which means that we, we learn accidentally by hearing from other people, which is why I think yeah. these webinars are important and so on. Um, but um, And we often do some of those by accident because we're drawn to things. We're drawn to listening. We're drawn to reading. We're drawn to all sorts of things. Um, but somebody's just been asking about vitamins and minerals. Did you, did you take any vitamins and stuff when you were giving up drinking or...? Yeah, I did, but that was it was mainly because of my skin. Because my yeah. skin was so bad, I still and you know, I was at the stage of yeah, but I'm drinking loads of water. I haven't drunk for three, alcohol for three months. I'm eating I was doing Slimming World, so I was eating fruit and vegetables and it was still bad. So I Googled what was good for skin. So I took um I took vitamin C because I was convinced that the reason I got so ill was because I was lacking in vitamin C. It probably wasn't, it was probably the alcohol. Um I took, I think, vitamin D, um, and I took, like, a m mega mix of vitamins. But if I'm totally honest, I don't think 
any of those help me. No, actually, we. I didn't notice. I did. I wasn't like, oh my god, this is amazing. What has helped me is drinking loads of water. Yeah. I think water is just brilliant. So certainly water and, and definitely, uh, you know, do take vitamin B, do take vitamin D, do those sort of things. But in the file section of the Club Soda Group, there's a book called What Do You Put In Your Mouth Instead that was co-written with Sam Waterhouse. And she talks about all the things okay. that are great in a healthy diet that should give you all those vitamins, but also deal with your cravings. And of course, if you're not hungover, then you're not, uh, you're at least not putting all the shit in your body or you've got more control over the shit you put in your body. Yeah. I totally accept that you may have a bit more of a sweet tooth when you give up drinking. Did you have a sweet tooth? Well, I've always, you know, I've always had a sweet tooth, but it is a bit ridiculous. <laughs> it's the rewarding, you know, it's like I've walked seven miles today, so I'm going to have some ice cream. And that's what I've got. To, that's my next thing to tackle. But I'm still not ready. I'm like, I don't smoke and I don't drink. And they're two massive things. So I'm going to eat as much ice cream as I want. I do not care. Yeah. That's my philosophy. But that has to change at some point. Because um, I can't continue to walk so much. <laughs> what? what um, you're going to have to start running. Oh, don't. Everybody's like, oh, when are you going to start running? I, I ran through Delhi Airport to get my plane back to, um, the, back to London. And when I got to the plane and I couldn't breathe and everybody was laughing at me, I was like, and that is the reason I don't run. Because I can't breathe. I can't run. I just look like an idiot so no i am keep on walking but i need to cut the ice cream i probably only need to walk a mile a day now but i'm eating so much ice cream that i have to walk shed loads of miles um what were your favorite podcasts um so i listened to the alcohol and addiction podcast a lot at the beginning um he's a guy in wales i, I was supposed to um, be interviewed by him but things didn't work out at the time I also did the Recovery Elevator podcast. I'm episode one, two, five. Um, that was quite amusing because I did it and then I never heard from him again. And then I was out walking one morning and I was like, oh, there's a new episode and started listening to myself. And that was just the bizarrest experience because you're just like, oh my God, that's actually me. You know, and, like, looking around you in know, the dark. None of those podcasts ask me because we, we support people to moderate as well. So they just, it's like, tumbleweed and then we will ask because i think i listened to one of you though uh you did I listen to one of you you listened to me on um on um thingy who's doing a webinar coming up at some point on sobriety rocks or something i suspect no, i don't know i definitely listened to one uh, because i re i remembered your story and i thought your story was fascinating i think all stories are fascinating because yeah. they're, they're all different and you know when you know somebody like yourself who's like been sober for such a long time it's really nice to here back to the beginning because you kind of I kind of know you as I know you now yeah. and you kind of don't think about the story behind it all so yeah I mean I um what else did I listen to uh, Russell Brand of course I listen to Russell Brand I've That's listened okay. to all of his podcasts you you can yeah. do that if you want to <laughs> but he's disappeared I don't know where he's gone from Radio X and he's, he's not doing anything at the moment so I need a fix no, no, you don't. You need you need a different person. But that's just my <laughs> bias because I did political campaigning in the same space as him. I think so. I'm like, oh, did you? <laughs> fuck off, Russell Brand. I'm not going there. You're a lunatic. Laura, I can't believe you just said that live. <laughs> <laughs> did I swear? Um, Be careful. Um, Helen Cooper's asking where you can find my story. Actually, there is um, a live webinar I did in my six years, uh, five years soberversary last year that's in the, um, if you go into the video section of Club Soda, you can um, uh, see that there. I will try and post it in here afterwards. Um, so, so that's helpful. I wanna go back a bit more to the beginning of your story because yeah. to me, those are the really important bits because that's a bit that we all struggle with. What else did you find difficult at the beginning? What, was, what were the things that were a discomfort? Or were you all bloody gung-ho and, you know? No, no, I was, I mean, I, I, I th I've made it quite, um, well known I still struggle socializing evenings now I'm fine at lunchtime I'm fine at, fine at breakfast I just can't do evenings very well um, and that is hard when you've gone from being a party animal where your night starts at 9 p.m and then suddenly you're this person that goes to bed at 9 p.m it's a massive shift um, I mean I think I'm lucky because I live on my own that because I one of the questions I get asked a lot is when people have got partners and stuff that drink um, I'm not sure how I how easy that would have been because I'm very easily led. If somebody goes, oh, I'll have a chocolate, 
you know, I'll have a chocolate. I, I don't think about it. So it, it, I think I've been lucky that I live on my own and don't have temptation around me. But I did find evenings, evenings out. I mean, one time I went to the pub and I think that my friend said I lasted 17 minutes because I was just like, I just can't do it anymore. And it, it made me really sad because you do have to completely change your life. You know, and I, I haven't lost many friends. I, I don't think I've lost none. Oh, my close friends have been amazing. But you do have to accept that your friendship groups will change. I don't get invited to as many things as I used to, mainly because they're, they're not of interest to me. You know, to go and sit in a pub is not of interest to me anymore. I think I, I think that's an question now. I think that's an interesting one because I'm I'm very passionate about the fact that one of the most amazing things you can do in this life is meet new people, and our whole of our society has reduced that down to something you can only do when you're half pissed. And, yeah. Um, and yeah, but so, hang on a minute though. I've met all of you lot, so actually I've got more friends. You know, people say to me uh, about losing friends. I've got tons more friends being sober. But I just choose to meet you all in the day in the daylight. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And I leave the night owls to do whatever right. they're doing. I, I do believe your social life changes, um, mm. but it doesn't always change for the worse. It just changes. And actually, if you think about it, your life isn't the same as it was when you were 18 or when you were 25. It won't be the same when you're 60 or 80. Life does change. And so yeah. we shouldn't use fear of change as a way of stopping us from changing our drinking. We should try and focus on some of those new possibilities. And you talked about the fact that however much we will say to ourselves when we're drinking, we're so busy, we're so busy, there's no time. Once you've got that <laughs> drinking, you recognise how much time you've got spare. And suddenly you've got space. To for a while. Yeah. For a while. And now I, now I don't have any time again. Yeah. Now I, I, I honestly don't know how I fit hang, uh, hangovers in. I, just, I do not have a clue. Because but, but it, it's weird, isn't it? Because yeah. you kind of go from like a massive expanse of time. And then once you start doing the stuff that you've always wanted to do, you, you should have done. Like, uh, sorry? You normalise. You begin to normalise. Yeah, like, this. like exercise. Yeah. Like I don't know, just, you know, everybody talks about cleaning, you know, you suddenly get into the cleaning mode, the decluttering, the, you know, seeing people in the daytime. I see it that you revert a bit to childhood, that if you look at a little kid, that little kid is awake at like five in the morning, which drives everybody nuts, full of energy, full, ready to go, eat first, bit of energy, and then they're off for the day. That's how I feel now. And then my battery lasts really well without a snooze, without feeling rubbish, without these dips. And then at nine o'clock, I'm ready to go to bed yeah. like a kid. Yeah. And that's what that's what I think sobriety is like. It, it brings back the joy that you have as a kid. It brings back the, the regimentation that you have as a kid and takes away the crap. The chaos. Basically. What is basically yeah. chaos? Takes yes. it away. <laughs> yeah. There yeah. is less chaos in my life, but there's more connection. So I can I can do something social with people for two hours and it's a more meaningful and better time than it was yeah. on the five-hour benders that yeah, I used to do in the yeah. evening. Um, that you can't remember that anyway. you can't remember anyway. So actually, the, the, the time I spend with people is so, so much more nourishing. And I do, I use the word nourishing purposefully because there's lots of activity that we do that has no value, mental health value, no personal value to us. We do it. Lots of things I did just so I could drink. Not because I could meet yeah. people, but so I could drink. And now I do things because they enrich me and they excite me and they make me feel better and um, I get great joy from them. And suddenly that time is nourishing. I think the other thing is I, I, I thought I was the party animal. I thought I liked going to parties and I liked doing that nighttime stuff. And what I've kind of come to, because I've fought so hard to continue to be a sociable as I thought I was, I had to at one point, like people were like, it'll come back, it'll be fine. I've now come to the realization I'm not going to be that person anymore. I won't, you won't see me at two o'clock in the morning. I have no interest of being out at two o'clock in the morning anymore. And um, it's kind of like just accepting that then made me realize that actually before a party, I drink a bottle of wine because I was nervous because I was like, I, I don't like how I look. I don't like how I feel. I feel fat. I'm not going to look like her. I'm not going to look like her. No one's going to want to talk to me. I feel, you know, all this stuff, down a bottle of wine, you feel fine. You don't give a shit anymore, do you? You're like, oh, yeah, I'll go to the party. Then you make a twat out of yourself. Then you wake up the next morning and you're back to square one again. 
I've realised I just don't like parties. I didn't like parties before. I don't like parties now, you know. And it's just realising that not everybody is still going to remain a party yeah. animal sober. You don't have to. You get in your yeah. car and you bugger off and you leave everybody to it. So <laughs> it is a bit about that joy of missing out, isn't it? That actually it's... We, we, we worry that we may feel like we're missing out. You don't have yeah. to miss out if you don't want to, but you no. can leave when you're not enjoying yourself anymore. <laughs> the fact that we yeah. all end up drinking to stay at things we're not enjoying is just yeah. a hideous, hideous thing. <laughs> so we, we did the yeah. workshop yesterday and we said to and some people were saying, oh, well, you know, sometimes I need to be at a party because I'm bored. I said, if you're bored, go home. Yeah. Do something you want to do. This is part I of know. this great myth we've created about how al alcohol helps us do things. Often it helps us do things we're not enjoying. Um, just while you're on that, holidays for me, I mean, as people know, I went to Thailand and, and had the best time ever. And I'm getting a lot of messages from people at the moment saying they're going on holiday, specifically all-inclusive holidays. And that's going to be hard, but it's your decision. You know, yes, you can go and get hammered for two weeks, but if you've done 90 odd days, why would you want to do... I don't, I don't really uh, understand why you would want to do well, that. Well, it's, it's because people fear they're not going to be able to achieve it. And so it's, well, it's easier. Well, it's that's what, that's what we think it's all about. Yeah. That's what we think a holiday is about. And what I want to say to, to people is... When I was on holiday, there was one night, I was tired. I'd been up at five, walking down the beach. I'd, I'd laid in the sun all day. It was just an absolute nightmare. And then at like eight o'clock, I was sick of eating, sick of eating on my I'm own a little bit. I'm sick of being in the sun and, and, and eating. Sick of sitting in the sun. <laughs> no, but I was, I was just like, and I thought, why am I not going to bed? When I'm at home, I don't go out every single night and eat in a restaurant and then go out looking for something to do. You go home, you have a bit of food, you go to bed. And I thought, oh my God, we're so conditioned that on holiday, you have to stay up till two o'clock in the morning, Otherwise. drinking, drinking, drinking. And then the next day, you have to feel like shit all day, all day, all day, because you're hungover in the sun, it's too hot, blah, blah, blah. And so I went to bed at eight o'clock, and then I woke up the next day, and I went for my walk and all the rest of it. And I thought, you know, we have to change the mindset that that is what a holiday is about. Yeah. A holiday is not about being drunk a holiday is about Resting. recharging your batteries lying in the sun going to bed if you want to go to bed you don't have to be out all the time and yeah. having fun and also so and also it's about um and if you if you duck doing that first sober first it will only come around again and actually yeah. once you've done your first sober holiday and realized a you feel far rested and far better the sky didn't fall in you still had a great no. time and you might have actually done some things you wouldn't have thinking of doing before because you strayed from beside the pool. Then every holiday after that gets easier. It's like developing yeah. a superpower. Do a sober Christmas, yes. everything becomes easier after that. Do a sober birthday, yeah. it's like another superpower notch up. Do a sober holiday, another superpower notch up. And then suddenly yeah. it becomes, you, you, your mindset changes because you realise you don't want to do these special things drunk. Being drunk isn't special anymore doing what you yeah. want to do is special yeah so. i mean if you said to my friends that i'd be looking to trek up a volcano on my holiday i wouldn't e i wouldn't even walk anywhere on holiday before like i just wouldn't even move from the bar and specifically have a waitress that bought me massive gin and tonics that was my idea of a holiday so uh, you know things do check that they, they naturally evolve into something else anyway so that you end up spending but, your but time i am worried doing about you different Dawn, things because i i do <gasps> think you're you're still very clumsy and uh, you do know a volcano's got a big hole in it you could fall in <laughs> don't my mum was like you do realize it could erupt at any time i said yeah i'm gonna walk up it and she was like oh my god so um yeah I am a different person. I don't need a bottle of wine to get out of that volcano. No. I'm going to be... And, and somebody's just talked it. about getting your money's worth. We, we believe that things that are free are getting your money's worth. Um, what's amazing about all inclusive... That's what, that's what my mum said at lunchtime when we were talking about it. That's exactly what she said. That our attitude is, well, I've paid for it, so I have to have it. But you know... And I said... Karen. I said, you can get lovely smoothies. You can get milkshakes. You can get... There's like loads of... You're still getting your money's worth. You're just not getting a hangover. I, I also think it's funny that we often talk about that it's quite expensive to do a diet in the UK because all that fruit costs lots of money and it's easier to buy cheap shit. 
So then when we go on holiday and all of the fruit and all of the healthy stuff is free, we don't go for that, do we? No, no we, go for we do not. That are, our eight pounds a, a tub in, in Itsu that are free on the all-inclusive on our holiday. No, we go, it's the cheap stuff in the booze, but actually that's the cheapest stuff on, on yeah. the holiday. Providing you yeah. with chips and cheap vodka punches <laughs> is not your money's worth. Eating the fresh fruit, the smoothies, the the special egg white omelettes if you're if that's what you're doing making them make something special for you because you're the fatty one that's your money's worth yeah but also i mean it's interesting you say that because i've always been i'm i'm someone that on holiday is like oh bacon and eggs cooked by someone else oh yeah i have that every day to take up the alcohol basically and this time i was going for the fruit i was actually surprised at myself i was like i'm actually choosing the fruit this is like really weird yeah and um and and that I think you touched on it earlier. Your tastes do change. You know, I used to eat a lot of takeaways. Now I think, oh, I can't be bothered to wait for it. You know, I'm just going to make something quick and then I will eat and then I'm done. Yeah. I kind of see food very differently. That's the other question that people ask is about the losing weight thing. I mean, in the first five weeks, I ate pretty much a box of Lindor balls, maybe more even every day, and. You know, that was my thing. And I'd go, oh, I'll just have one. I'll just have two. Oh, oh, that's another box gone. So I didn't lose weight, like, really quickly because the first five weeks I was literally full of Lindor balls. And then I went on to... I, I noticed somebody asked a question earlier about um, alcohol-free drinks. I, I, I was drinking those by the bucket loads. You know, my fridge was full. There's a photo somewhere. My fridge was full of, like, Belvoir and the elderflower and all the rest of it. And what has happened as time has gone on, okay, the ice cream became a bit of a problem, but I don't drink alcohol-free drinks anymore. And that's not because I'm against them. It's because your taste change. And I just have now developed an absolute love for sparkling water, which I hated before. And I don't need that sugary replacement special drink. I think people are always looking for the special drink that makes yeah. you feel special. And yes, you do do that. Of course you do that at the beginning because you're replacing something. It's a bit like vaping when you're giving up smoking. But eventually everything does kind of chill out. And, and that's, I think that's really important because it's about being an evolution and that you can't, you, everything doesn't have to change at once and, and maybe some things were different. I mean, my, I, I was a Red Bull drinker and um, I never drank it with alcohol. See how, how smug I could be. I never drank Red Bull with alcohol. That's terrible for you. <laughs> um, but I, my, alcohol, my Red Bull consumption went up because I wanted some highs. I wanted some highs. And so I would have one can, but I went from having a small can to the pint-sized can a day but then but you know but you know what that got me through the first six seven months yeah and then i dealt with the red bull and then weight came off but guess what the weights come back on again and that's all okay you know the the, the difference is is i i can still it's far easier for me to make good choices in my life and sometimes those good choices are about friendships and what i do with my day and i still eat the chocolate and sometimes they're good choices about my diet but i'm far more in control and that chaos has gone I think I think that's an interesting point. Like, I don't really care about my weight anymore. Like, before, it was such a massive thing. You know, it was literally from the moment you woke up to the moment you went to bed, you knew that you had a weight problem and it was hanging over your head. Now, I look at it, I... I, you know, I walk so much. I'm probably the, the fittest I've ever been. I'm healthy. I'm drinking so much water and I'm not poisoning myself. I don't really care about the rest of it anymore because I'm confident that I'm all right. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And when I was drinking, I was so, oh, I'm just not all right. And I'm just, you know, it brought me down so much. your mental so health better, your energy's better, yeah. your clarity, yeah. your ability to make decisions. Yeah. I've got a new health goal, though, that I should say out loud so that I can be oh, accountable. Yeah which is I'm going to bench press UC at by Christmas. I'm going to lift him, which is 10 stones. I'm going to do it on camera. I'm going to bench it's press gonna be great. UC. It's, so it's, worth, it's worth hanging out till Christmas for that. Yeah, I've been doing weights today. I'm on three <laughs> kilograms. I've only got 60 odd to go. Before I can, <laughs> see. It's going to be great. I see I'm, I wouldn't be so stupid as to make myself accountable for something like that <laughs> I've done enough accountability I'm not lifting any humans <laughs> um do you so can I ask a question do you think you're still in the pink fluffy cow stage of of drinking where everything's still a bit exciting and a bit woo or is it beginning to normalize a I bit just feel you? I feel normal I just feel 
I mean, obviously, sometimes it would be nice just to have a bit of a high in some ways. But I get that now. Like, as people know, when I see a sunset or a sunrise, it's really weird. It is like a little ping inside going, oh, my God, that's beautiful. I get it from th different things now. Whereas before, the sunrise to me just spelled disaster. You know, it was like, oh, my God, I've got to get home. Um, and... I just see my, I mean, I, I don't think about drink it. If I'm honest, I very rarely think about, I just don't, I just don't think about it. I, I don't want it in my life. I see it as a very negative thing. It makes me sad that we've got so sucked in by it. And that, you know, because I feel so good without it, I want, I feel like I'm a bit of a cult leader. I'm like, come on. I just want you to all feel this because you can feel it, but we're just not patient enough sometimes to wait that long. I, um, I was, I was going to say, I, I mean, my, my mindset changed, I see around six months. That's when I decided it wasn't for a year that it was going to be forever. Yeah. That and for that's quite too. a long time. Yeah. Sorry. That was for me too, about that time. Yeah. And that's quite, six months is quite a long time to be patient for cause yeah. in this inpatient society, you know, and, but once you get there, you know, it's just, just the other side is, I mean, don't get me wrong. I, th I think sometimes people probably think that I just bound around with happiness. You know, I do, I can still be a moody little bugger sometimes. And no. life's not, life, life is not always happy. I think that's the other thing is people expect sober to be happy all the time. But it's not happy all happy the time. Happy all the because... time is not normal either. No. <laughs> sometimes we can be but... totally indifferent and just yeah. okay. And that's normal. That's what normal human beings yeah. are. But I'm just glad I don't have the, I, you know, I realise I'm quite an all right person. I spent a long time thinking there was something wrong with me. The only thing that was really wrong with me is what I was doing to myself. Yeah. You know, it, it, there's nothing wrong with me. I'm, I'm not a bad person. I'm fine. But that stuff was making me, it was changing my mindset about myself. Yeah. And I think it's the, um, Jonathan's asked about, um, what's our one tip for someone wanting to quit booze and you've talked about patience and I am really and I am not a patient person no and nor am Just I ask my friends yeah <laughs> I've got I've got the attention span of a gnat but so have I it is true and I think when I see people on on the group who who expect things to be perfect really quickly and, and, and then talking about, you know, maybe going back and moderating. I just want to say, just leave it a little bit longer. Just leave it a bit longer. I know. I want to, I know. I want to stop I know. you I going mean, through the hard bit again. Because uh, there will be a point where you'll go, right, I need to try again. And, and then you have to go all through that hard bit again, which is where you feel tired, want to drink lots of water, yeah. maybe get some withdrawal symptoms. And I'm not saying that moderation isn't possible because it is for some people, but definitely there are people in the group who I, who I know ultimately want to be alcohol free. And I just, I want to save them the, the pain, but also we can't do that. We all have to no. feel that ourselves and go through it in I, our own I, way. Yeah. I think that's the thing is I'm a control freak as well. So I want everybody to be doing what I'm doing. A noisy and patient um, control freak. It's great. I know. Is that what you put on your can you imagine that? On, can you imagine that on alcohol? Jesus Christ. I'm surprised I had any friends left. Um, but I, I, you know, I'd watch people and I'm just like, oh, please. You know, I'd say to people, you're getting to the good bit. And people say, well, what is the good bit? And I'm like, yeah, but when you get there, it is like a bit of a secret club, isn't it? Like you kind of get there. You kind of don't know that you're there. And then when you look back, you kind of realise, I, and I definitely think it's around six months, you kind of go, oh, right, this is what it's about. Your sleep kind of regulates, your health feels better, you're making better choices, you're not eating like a horse, um, you know, like everything's just kind, it and, kind of settles a and bit. And there's no one big, oh my God, this is amazing. For me, it's like a million little epiphanies and they're still happening. Yeah. And, yeah. and it's nearly six years for me and it's still happening because I realise particularly when I do some things that I knew would never be possible if I was still drinking or um, things that, yeah, d just feeling things in a very different way. And, and sometimes I feel sad things and I find that quite hard. But when I feel happy things and I'm, I'm fully in control of that and I don't feel I need to be happier by drinking something, that I can just be happy as, at the level I am and, and yeah. be there, then that's actually amazing. And uh, somebody came on the workshop yesterday and she described, she, she's done three months now and she feels like it's been like a million little epiphanies. And that's what yeah. it is. It's no one big thing. It's no one big no. thing that makes you give up. It's no one big thing that makes you stay sober, I think. Yeah. No, you're right. So...
So yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you a quick question, which is that you're gonna write more of this down in a book and I want to know how that's going. <laughs> so Slow. how's procrastination going now that you're sober, Dory? Oh, I didn't know that I was such a great procrastinator. It's been brilliant. I've 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 defrosted my freezer because this is where I sit, like here, and I can see the freezer. I can see stuff. So I sit here and I kind of go, oh, yeah, I'll just do that. I'll come back to it in a minute. So, yeah, it's not been great. But I, I just feel like with my blogs, like I'll wake up in the morning and that's my time. So I need to kind of change my daily structure, which has become very regimented. I like the way my things are in control, control freak in me. So when I wake up and I do the blog and then I go for a walk and then I come back and then I go to work all day, by the time I get home, I'm not really in the mood to be writing a book. So some things got to change, but I also just don't feel really ready for that at the moment. Well, it makes, I think that's the other thing. I just your... go with how I feel yeah. at the moment. You know, and that's the difference is when I drank, I didn't, I didn't feel anything. So you were just making stupid, stupid decisions and stupid choices. And Thailand taught me a lot of just go with your gut. If things aren't feeling right, there's, there's nothing wrong my with that. My gut instinct is amazing now. It's amazing. Mine is, yeah. About yeah. people and, and myself. Just, and I kind of go, okay, you haven't got it in you today. Why are you going to be so hard on yourself? You've done so many other things today. Don't worry about it. Maybe, so I'm kind of maybe it's about the seeing, best procrastinator. Well, maybe it's about seeing your book as, as, as a series of blogs. And if you yeah I mean I've got there's loads there's obviously a lot of material there's a lot of stuff to and there's a lot of things to put together I kind of need just a bit of time I struggle a bit with doing a day job and doing that in my spare time but you're, you're I mean I have written I have written stuff but you know we haven't written any book sure. sorry we're like the only people who haven't written a book so I'm a five I know talk. it's the pressure from the others no well I I, I haven't I have some ideas but at some point there's so much other stuff for us to do. So, but so it's good. I can just tell you what to do instead, and that feels better. <laughs> Go write your book, Dawn. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> cool. I can't see any more questions. Um, wife carrying competition in Finland. Oh, yeah. For, I don't make Lucy carry me. That's a really unfair end of the stick. Um, <laughs> Dawn, would you date a drinker? Oh. Well, let's get a date first. That would help, wouldn't it? I can tell you that if anybody was looking at, you know, they do that blind date thing on um, in The Guardian. Um, yes. And my friend was reading it the other day and phoned me up to say that there's a guy in on that who, who said very specifically, I work in the drinks trade and I drink a lot. I would never date someone who's not a drinker because alcohol is the rock around which I live my life. Swipe. Your rock his rock alcohol is his rock we have to tell you mate <laughs> but do you know what i i was kind of like that before i was saying i don't know if i told you this but like when i was doing my dating profile when i was drinking i said that i, I didn't drink very much and that i was a non-smoker and then before i'd go i drink a bottle of wine smoke 10 marble lights i get there thinking that i probably smelt really beautiful and instead they were probably like oh my god jesus she smells like an ashtray and she's absolutely hammered so it's really nice not to lie now. I don't have to lie about anything. I don't have to. I don't have to take photos from up here to disguise the chins. I don't have to lie about not smoking, drinking. Excuse me. But what I do find is because I'm so alert to everything, I don't date very much. With regard to whether I date a drinker, my my problem with dating a drinker is that most people don't have a couple. And I don't think I'd be very good with a drunk person because I'm not very patient. So I would prefer somebody that didn't drink, but I also think that's probably a little bit unrealistic. Yeah, I mean, Lucy so, still drinks, but he drinks so rarely. So there'll be people like that for whom it's a, they can, there are people for whom they can just leave it. It's not a big issue. Um, thanks, Liz, for reminding me you had a question. It's hard to see them on here sometimes. So thanks for letting me know. She says, do either of you feel that being public as a pressure or does that help keep you sober? Um, I don't really think about it very much, um, because I'm not ashamed of it. I just, I just kind of think that this is me and I had a problem and I don't have a problem anymore. So I, I, I don't really see it as an issue. I also think I've met so many amazing people through it that how can it not be a good thing? 
Um, I, I mean, the blog was never it. It was never supposed to be what what it's turned into. It was supposed to be a bit of a well. I thought it was going to be a whinge about how awful sober life was, and then crack on on New Year's Eve, get drunk, and go back to the normal life. So I didn't expect to meet so many amazing people, have opportunities that you've given me. You know, going to the House of Commons was just like crazy. You know, that would never have happened before. Um, and so being public is actually, you know, it's been, it's been great for me. So no, I don't, you know, I've got nothing to be ashamed of. So yeah, no. I think for me, it's interesting because I've always been a very public person. I was elected, I've stood for parliament and all those sort of things. And then before I set up Club Soda, I was running a, um, a banking campaign. I went on Newsnight to talk about the future of banking. I can't believe it. <laughs> I mean... What I know about banking is about as much as you all We're going to be banking, looking for that now. Right? Um, yeah, it's on there somewhere where I did this face at a banker who went, no, we all behave perfectly. And I went, <laughs> like that. Oh, um, be brilliant. So I've always been quite a public person, but it is still quite weird to say, particularly when you've done things that where the public expect you to be, um, be better behaved than them, even though we know yeah. um, people in public life aren't. I sometimes feel a little bit anxious that if I decide to go into politics again, what impact would this have on me? I Sometimes I talk about my dad and then I panic that my mum will see it. My mum, you know, helps do stuff for Club Soda and I don't want to, you know, my dad died of drinking and I don't want my mum to feel like I've, I, I don't want to upset my mum, basically. Sometimes I panic yeah. about those things. But definitely, if I drank again, I would let you all down and that would make me very sad and you'd be really all angry with me. So it does help to a degree. Well, it does, because I've always said that I will never, ever, there will never be a status from me saying, oops, you know, it just can't happen. It will not happen. You know, there won't be another day one. And and that is a massive, you know, I say to people, you have to write this stuff down. Writing for me has saved my bacon. You know, you have to write it down. I, if I think of my rock bottom moment, still now, I, I get that feeling in my stomach. And that's because I've written down everything that I've felt since then. And it, I, I hope that little moment is always there because it does, it, you know, it keeps me on the straight and narrow. I, I don't want to go back to that life. That life wasn't doing anything for me. Um, and that's why I say to people, write down how you, when you've had that rock bottom moment, you wake up the next day and you're like, oh my God, I can't believe what happened. You have to write it down because you will forget. The only yeah. reason we all pick up a drink again is because that feeling goes away and we go, oh, this time it's going to be all right. And then you do it again yeah. and you do it again and you do it again. And, you know, I just, I cannot go back to how I felt on that rock bottom moment ever again. Yeah. That is that. But is that. for me and for some others here, it might be, it was about having the idea. So I, I had this idea for Club Soda within the first few months of giving up drinking because I thought, what, what, what can I do to help other twats like me, basically? Um, and, and also because cause actually deep down, I also thought um, when my dad died, I thought, what could I have done differently? What, what could I do that would be different? And I'm not a therapist. I'm not a counsellor. I'm, I'm not one of those types of people. I am a movement builder. And actually, it took me a while to recognise that again in myself after giving up drinking. I thought there were things that yeah. were wrong with me about the fact that I, 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 you know, that the way I'd lived my life and the things that had interested me and what I did as jobs and all the politics and stuff. But I am a movement builder, and there are many ways to build movements. And though I did try to make Club Soda a proper grown-up business to begin with, all I've done is created a movement. If you all tell me you write to restaurants and ask them to get something better on their menu that makes me far more happy <laughs> like, yeah! you've done an amazing job you don't put yourself down you know it's amazing oh, I know, club it's... sodas you know with i mean i can't remember how i found club Soda. i mean i think i just googled sober and somehow it came up yeah. but like you guys have just been amazing and, and that's why i say to people go to club soda because when I started, I didn't realise that there were so many people out there that felt the same as me. And I think that's what people say, is you think you're out there down in your saving yon on a Friday night going, I hate this, I hate this, I don't want to feel rubbish tomorrow. But there's a whole massive gang of us yeah. all feeling the same. And we're all, and that's... And we're all loud and we're all, you know, we're all amazing people. Um, we're here together and then we give each other confidence to push the envelope, yeah. to push the boundaries, to 
to try other well, I said, like, club so the club soda meetups, can you imagine if you did put wine in the mix? It would be absolute chaos. No, because everyone's the, like, we're all retired party animals, aren't we? I did think Never that if you put, if, with, if, if you put you, me, Andriana and Janet all yes. would drink in a room together, there wouldn't be, no one else could hear what they would be saying. That's how that would work. <laughs> <laughs> There's Janet. I can see her. Hi, Janet. <laughs> That's all right. We've Can been, you hear us? Just been talking about you. Anyway, um, we've now been on here for nearly an hour, which is not a surprise, oh, actually. <laughs> it must be bedtime. <laughs> so I'm going to I'm going to um, I'm going to finish here, but we can always have another chat another time. And I yeah, hope everyone's liking this format because I'm going to we've got an interview with Carwin coming up. And I am really interested if anybody else wants to do this format with me and is happy to talk a bit more publicly. Um, this webinar will be on the group and stay on the group, but it will also be on YouTube and go out in the email tomorrow. So it means that they, public, can, public. they can hear our ramblings tomorrow. Hooray! <laughs> How exciting. They can watch it over and over again. Yeah! Woo! Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everyone, I'm going to I'm going to leave it there. And thank you so much for your time, Dawn. You're bye. welcome. Thank bye. you. See you later. Bye.